Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is for the first 15 or 20 minutes, I'm just going to try and give you some background and conceptual grounding. And then hopefully, uh, when, once I've done that, we can just see where the conversation takes us. Um, so what I want to talk about today is big data. Not this data, unfortunately. As much as I love this data, this is not the data I will be talking about today. Um, in the next 15 to 20 minutes, what I'll try and do is I'll try and give you a working definition of big data. And then I'll try and give you some examples of the effect that it's having in terms of some of the disciplines that we work with on a regular basis. Um, and then I will talk just a little bit about the effect that I see it having on libraries in general and maybe some future directions for us in particular. Okay, so in order to give you enough background to talk about big data, I first have to talk about the problem that the developing world, and by that I mean everybody who uses computers, is experiencing with data production and storage. So right now, IBM Corporation estimates that we are producing about 2.5 quintillion bytes of data per day, which is a lot. Um, and in fact, the rate at which we are producing data is also accelerating, so that IBM also estimates that 90% of the data that exists in the world right now was created in the last two years. So let's take a minute to appreciate that. We're talking about the dawn of recorded history to the year 2012, 90% of the information produced in that period, last two years. Now, what is this data? Where is it coming from? It's all kinds of stuff. It's financial transaction data. Every time you swipe your credit card, that transaction is being recorded and it's being added to the world store of data. It's human genome sequencing data and also sequencing data for other non-human creatures. It is uh, Twitter posts. It is YouTube videos. It is all kinds of stuff. And a lot of it we are producing just as a byproduct of living our lives in a computerized society. In fact, we have so much information and the store of information is growing so fast that we have to keep making up units of measurement to describe how much information exists. And the newest unit of measurement is the zettabyte, which is 1 billion terabytes or roughly equivalent to the information in 50 million libraries of Congress. Now to try and give you some idea of the scope of that, the largest consumer hard drives you can buy right now, their storage is measured in terabytes. Okay, a terabyte can store about 150 hours of HD quality video. Multiply that by a billion. That's a zettabyte. Um, experts are saying, according to some of the stuff that I've read, that by the year 2015, we will have to measure the world's information storage in terms of zettabytes. Um, trying to explain to you how much information exists in the world is kind of like trying to explain to you how big space is. The units of measurement are really so huge that the human mind cannot conceptualize them. How big is space? Well, it's really effing big. You know, how much information do we have in the world? A whole effing lot. Um, so basically what this means is we are making more and more information every day, and we are making more and more information as time goes on. And that poses some obvious problems in terms of storing and accessing all of that data. But it also creates these tremendous possibilities for furthering human knowledge by being able to do research that we would not even have been able to dream of um, in the decades before we had these huge data sets. And I'll, I'll talk about some specific examples uh, a bit more in a, in a second. OK, so what is it that makes data big? We've been talking a lot about size. And size is definitely part of the equation, but it's not all of the equation. Okay, and there's not a definite cutoff point where I can say, okay, well, five terabytes of information is big data. The bigness, the size at which something becomes big data is relative to the capabilities of the people or organization who actually want to process and analyze that data. Okay, so processing, say, a terabyte of data here in the library would be very difficult for us. Um, it would strain our, our capabilities. Um, a big corporation like IBM or Target who has massive computing resources could probably do that in 15 minutes. Okay, so the size at which something becomes big data is, rel is relative. But there are also other parts to this equation, the complexity of data. Um, oftentimes you're talking about data sets that are in very different formats and you want to look at them together and that creates a computational problem. Like say I'm a company and I have an order database over here and that database is, gives me all this information about how much customers have paid about, for orders and what they've ordered and it's all organized by customer name and order number. 
but then I have this separate database over here for my supply chain and that keeps track of materials that I order, how much I paid for them, the distributors that I work with and that's all based on a different ordering number system and organized by distributor. Well I want to look at those two databases together because I want to be able to answer questions like how much am I spending on packing materials and how much is that actually pulling away from my profit margin. Well to do that I have to do some pretty sophisticated data rejiggering um, to get those two data sets into a format where I can look at them together. Okay, now multiply that by five different kinds of formats, ten different kinds of formats. I mean, we're dealing with that many different formats here in the library. Um, that's a problem. Um, and then finally, we have distribution. So as computing becomes more distributed, and what I mean by that is increasingly we are dealing with software and data that is stored on a computer that's not on your desk, not in the building, not in the state, not in the country. Um, and when we're talking about very large data sets, that creates an access problem. Like, how do I get that data? I can't just copy it if it's several terabytes or an exabyte. Like, I would have to deal with it where it is. So is there some sort of programming interface? Is there a web interface that I have to go to? How do I get access to that data? Okay, let me give you a concrete example of how this is all very relative. Um, one of the projects I worked on in my English degree before I left was a citation project that my advisor wanted to do. He wanted to pull all the citation data from the Journal of American Folklore from the beginnings of the journal in 1880 to the present day. And he wanted to do computerized analysis so that he could look at trends, citation trends. Okay, well, that data exists and it is accessible through JSTOR. But you have to do it through a programming interface. And he didn't have the programming chops to actually build a program that would extract that data. Okay, so he had an access problem. And obviously, even though the data was only a few gigabytes, because it's textual data, he couldn't process it manually. He wasn't going to be able to look through the citations and be like, okay, I see a pattern here. He was going to have to do computerized analysis. So the size was a problem. And then finally, once we actually had the data on our desktop and we're looking at it, we were like, this data is in a format that makes absolutely no sense for our analysis. We need to change the entire structure of this data. And that required some programming chops. So even though we were only dealing with like five gigabytes of data, I would still classify that as a big data problem. It had all the hallmarks, size, complexity, and distribution. Okay, so big data is big. Um, it's big not only in terms of size and complexity, but it's also big in terms of societal impact. So let's, let me just give you rapid fire a couple of examples of the way in which big data is changing some of the academic disciplines. Um, and I've got two big picture examples. The first is in the sciences. Um, the sciences are being profoundly affected by the advent of big data. So astronomy, um, astronomers actually have a very long history of dealing with very large data sets. And that goes all the way back to the first stellar catalogs in the 1800s that catalog thousands of celestial bodies. Well, measuring instrumentation has gotten a lot better since then. So astronomers are able to see more of the sky. So they have more data about it. So we're, talk we're talking like a couple thousand to millions, billions, trillions of celestial bodies that they can see clearly and that they can make these very detailed observations about over time. So they are experiencing some serious data creep. But at the same time, having all of this data means that they can know more about how the heavens work. Um, biology and ecology, let's talk about genome sequencing. Um, one article I read said that the amount of genomic data that we are generating is doubling roughly every five months. Okay, now computing power and storage only doubles every year and a half, which means that in a few short years, we will probably be in a situation, unless we do something really creative, where not only can we not analyze all of the genomic data that we have, we won't even be able to store it. That's a huge deal. Okay, medical research. Um, there are now many strains of disease, uh, uh, of disease and bacteria that are resistant to conventional treatments like penicillin. And so one of the things that uh, medical researchers are looking at are using these very complex chemical cocktails to treat those disease resistant strains of bacteria. But creating those cocktails and calibrating them correctly and testing them takes an immense amount of time. So one approach that researchers are trying is this uh, virtual testing where they model the, the virus, then they model the chemical compound, and they try and study the interaction on a computer screen. Well, not only does this require tremendous amounts of data, it also produces tremendous amounts of data. And that's really what's slowing that particular piece of research down, is where do we get all of that data, and then where do we put the results? Uh, in business, 
there are two areas in which big data is having a, a serious impact on business. And the first is the anal anal uh, is analyzing operational data. Um, so the example that I have for you is Seattle Children's Hospital. Um, they spend a significant amount of money setting up a special software package called Tableau. Um, and it analyzes terabytes worth of data that's distributed in, di in different databases all over their organization and allows them to look at that data together. And that's done two things for them. First, they've saved about $3 million in operational costs. And the second is that they have located medical errors that they would have missed otherwise, and they have been able to set up clinical trials that they wouldn't have been able to do um, without that data. So it's improving their ability to serve their customers, and it's also saving them money. Um, the other thing uh, that's, that it's having an impact on is marketing. Uh, the holy grail of marketing is to be able to target you, the individual, with a, a, a marketing campaign that's tailored specifically to your interests and needs. The data to do that in many cases already exists. Um, companies are, are tracking just an immense amount of consumer data. What's been holding them back is their ability to actually crunch that data down to the individual level. But that is quickly changing. Um, companies like IBM and Target are in-house developing these huge technological infrastructures and hiring experts that will let them predict your buying habits, like your personal buying habits. So the example that I have here is actually one that straddles business and politics, uh, and that is the Obama campaign. Um, one of the biggest advantages they had over the Romney campaign was their very sophisticated use of big data. Um, one of the first things they did in this last campaign was they took their um, voter information database, their polling database, and they merged it with their financial contribution database. So over here they had all the names and information of the people who had given money to the Obama campaign in the past. And over here they had all this information about people who were inclined to vote Democrat. And what putting them together allowed them to do was move in both directions. Like we know this person has given money, let's make sure they're also registered to vote. This person has indicated they would vote Democrat. Let's also hit them up for some money. It also allowed them to do some very sophisticated marketing analysis in terms of how they elicited donations. So if you signed up for the Obama campaign, as I did, what happened was you got several different kinds of email messages. And some of them were supposedly written by Michelle Obama. And some of them were supposedly written by Barack Obama. And some of them by Joe Biden. And some of them by the campaign manager. And what they were doing there is they were sending out different targeted email messages to different groups. And then looking and seeing, did they give money after getting this email? No? Well, then let's use a different approach. And uh, as a result of this, they were able to raise over $1 billion in direct co campaign contributions, which is unprecedented. People didn't even think it was possible before they did it. So it's a big deal. OK, so that is just like a couple of, really, there are all sorts of disciplines. Like I originally had a slide in here on the humanities and the social sciences. I just didn't have time for it. So, okay, so let's talk about us. What effect do I see this having on us? Based on my reading, I see sort of three broad areas in which uh, this trend is going to affect libraries. Um, the first is library operational data. Okay, like most businesses, we have become more computerized in the past couple of decades. And like businesses who have become more computerized, we are now keeping more and more information on library operations. You know, we have interlibrary loan statistics, we have gate counts, we have um, item checkout statistics. Um, I don't see any reason why analyzing that data in the same way that a business analyzes it would not be beneficial to us. I, I just don't see any reason why not. Um, we would potentially be able to locate areas of inefficiency, maybe pinpoint areas where we can serve patrons better. Um, so that, I mean, treating library data just like a business treats its data. The other thing that I'm already seeing in the library literature is libraries making these very impassioned arguments about how libraries have a role to play in curating and storing and providing access to these extremely large data sets. And the argument there is that it's basically contiguous with our stated goal to preserve and provide access to human knowledge, which is fantastic, but I think there are also some serious challenges there that I'll talk about in just a minute. Okay, so curating research data. Um, the other area in which I'm seeing is an extension of the operational data. I have seen some projects where libraries have begun to take their operational data and overlay that with student achievement data so that they can look for, relate, for uh, correlations between contact with the library and student achievement in terms of GPA and grades. 
So one of the links that I sent to you was University of Wollongong in Australia, their library cube project. That is exactly what they are doing. They are extracting database usage information from their easy proxy server, and they are overlaying that with student grade data. So, and what they are finding is that the more time students spend using library databases, in general, the better their grades are. There is a relationship, a statistically provable relationship there. And that is huge in terms of advocating for resources, demonstrating our value to the organization. It's also really complicated, uh, and there are privacy concerns, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But those are the three broad areas that I'm seeing right now. Um, challenges, I mean, that's all well and good, but what does that mean in terms of where we are now and where we would need to be? Um, curating these massive data sets, storing them, providing access to them, requires some serious technical infrastructure. And I'm talking um, servers that cost thousands of dollars, um, software that can cost, an Oracle data warehouse can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, you can't just stick it in the MySQL database, which is what we tend to use around here. Um, it also requires expertise and skills that are not widely distributed right now. You know, what companies like Target and IBM are doing is they're having to build their own expertise in-house because there just aren't enough people who have the kind of skills in manipulating these large data sets that you can go out and just hire somebody off the street. And I've actually tried to do some of the, the technical reading in this field. Most of the time I feel like I'm reading Greek. It's, it's just such a specialized skill. Um, and so that brings us to dollars, you know, resources, staff time, money, um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then if we wanted to do something like try to collect data and overlay it with student data, there's a privacy concern there. Now, I think that there are ways of dealing with that. You know, Wollongong has some built-in ways that their university handles that confidentiality. And also, they have built their library queue project in such a way to protect student privacy. Um, but it is something to be aware of. So with all that in mind, what about us? Um, I think there are a couple of things that we could and maybe should do. Of the three avenues that are open to libraries, I think operational data is the comparatively low-hanging fruit. Right? The, the value of that seems obvious. We already have access to most of the data. Um, and so what I would like to do there, what I think makes sense, is for us to look at the data that we are actually storing and ask ourselves, is there a better way to access and use and analyze this data? Can we look at the data that we have in aggregate? Can we start combining it? What do we see when we do that? And I've already started taking some baby steps in that direction um, by helping people to uh, better track their own data. I mean, this is a big part of the reason why I helped um, Mary build her instruction database is because I see that as a stepping stone. Now we have an in-house system for managing that, and that means that I can reach into that database and get that data whenever I want it because I know how it's formatted. I know where it resides. Um, so stuff like that. As far as the other two avenues, analyzing our own data in relation to students and curating massive data sets, I think it's worth talking about. Um, however, when I look at our present technological capability and where we would need to be in order to actually say, yes, we are going to curate your big data set, I see a big gulf. So if we decided that that is something that we wanted to do, there would have to be some serious discussion and planning um, that would take, and I'm planning, I'm talking like years worth of planning, that would get us to the point where we were ready to do that. But I do think it's worth maybe um, querying the rest of campus and seeing, you know, where, is there a big data need out there right now? And if not, how far off is it? Because I think it's just a question of time. You know, our discipline's five years away, 10 years away, 15 years away. I think that answer will probably vary by discipline, and I think that's maybe something worth knowing. Um, I also think it's maybe worth looking at what would it take to be able to do analysis of our own data with student data, like exactly how far away from that are we, and what are the, the particular challenges. So for those avenues, I think I would advocate some conversation. Um, and I think either way we go, we're going to have to talk about better technical infrastructure. And by that, I mean server space. I mean software. I mean expertise. And I don't know exactly what that's going to look like right now. Um, but I think a conversation on that could be started. If for no other reason, then we're going to be moving into this very big building that has all this technological capability. But a lot of the systems that we're running on the back end are running on the equivalent of like a TRS-80. You know, the way we develop software here is going to have to change, um, especially if we're going to do something like curate massive data sets. We're talking complete transformation. So 